A lot of investors, they hop on this aggressive roller coaster without even realizing it. They see an investment makes 20%, 30%, 40%. They say, give me some of that. I want that. Who, who, who doesn't? But they, they see that after it made that return, right? They didn't get in it beforehand. It's always afterwards. And they don't know the risk in this portfolio. They don't know that it has a high standard deviation. It has a high beta, and we'll explain that today. And all of a sudden, they hop onto it after it made 30 or 40%. And of course, it can't continue that, right? If, if it made 30% per year, what would your return? I mean, you double your money every three years. You know, it's not going to happen. So I get on, and all of a sudden, right? That happens. And then they get out. I didn't know that that could happen. And then that causes permanent losses for them. That's a really big, big behavior problem. When they should have been on this roller coaster, the medium one, or maybe even the baby roller coaster. So you have to know which one that you're on. So standard deviation and beta are the two measurements that we have. So standard deviation, the higher the standard deviation, the higher the volatility. The higher the beta number, the higher the risk in the portfolio. This is critically important. Don't be tempted to take on more risk and volatility than you can handle because there will be volatility in the portfolio. Right now we're experiencing upside volatility. But we have these classes when we experience downside volatility, right? You guys have been through those classes with me together. So we're going to watch this first video on understanding beta. It's a really good explanation. Beta is a historical measure of the risk an investor is exposed to by holding a particular stock or portfolio as compared to the market as a whole. The beta of a share in Casey's Corn Company is 0.5. This means that Casey's has historically been 50% less volatile than the market. So if the market moves up by 10%, Casey's stock will only appreciate 5%. If the market declines by 2%, Casey's corn will lose only 1% of its value. The change in market value is multiplied by a stock's beta to estimate its movement. The risk and reward trade-offs suggest that high beta stocks have a greater risk and, as a result, a higher expected return. If Casey's has a beta of 1.5, it will theoretically be 50% more volatile than the market. This means it is likely to gain 15% when the market gains 10% and lose 3% when the market drops 2%. A stock with a beta of 1 would move in tandem with the wider market. Both low and high beta stocks have their place in a portfolio. Low beta stocks are stable. Their performance is weaker than the market as a whole when the stock market is strong, but when the markets drop, these stocks usually experience less dramatic declines. High beta stocks are the opposite. They outperform when the market's strong and fall further when the market declines. However, it is important to remember that beta is a historical measurement, so it can't predict the future. The beta of a stock will change as more historical data points are added and many such events will prove to be entirely unpredictable. Beta is a useful measure for investors because it helps them create portfolios that match their risk tolerance. So what I like about that video is you notice it says it's historical measurement. It can't predict the future. So it says that right up front. and. You have, to, you have to recognize that because the beta risk measurements can change. It's less reliable on an individual stock and more reliable on a portfolio of holdings. For example, we have over 12,000 holdings in most of our portfolios, so it's more reliable. One individual stock is not going to affect the beta too much in a portfolio of stocks. But if you have an individual stock any day of the week, that beta can all of a sudden go crazy up or crazy down because of some event in that particular company, uh, which could be a good thing if it goes up, but it could be a dramatically bad thing if it goes down. So uh, even though we can get it on every single 
stock and mutual fund and ETF that's out there in, in a portfolio, uh, you have to understand it's better to use on a portfolio of holdings. So standard deviation is the next measurement, and that's the volatility of the portfolio. We know that the volatility of stocks is higher than bonds, and the volatility of bonds is higher than cash. So we have to find the right mix between you and I talking together and you talking with Scott. What volatility level is best for you? What can you, what can you handle? What can you go through? Because we know we're not going to have permanent losses when we have 12,000 holdings all around the world. You just, you know, for that to happen, that would be you know global Armageddon uh, so we're not betting on individual stocks we have to find out what kind of volatility that you can ride through so understanding deviation and standard deviation is this next video and Kelly I know you said you you came to this class to understand how to, how to get risk so they're gonna give you the formula here so have your pen ready and write down that formula okay Standard deviation, or variance, is a measure applied to the annual rate of return of an investment to measure the investment's volatility. Every time you buy a stock or a mutual fund, you're weighing its expected return against its inherent risk. The past gains or losses of an investment are fairly easy to look up, but gauging risk is a little trickier. Applying the standard deviation formula will show how much an investment's price has gone up or down in the past and therefore helps in evaluating future outcomes. Take for example a security where we analyze five periods of the following stock returns. 2% in January, 7.5% in February, 1% in the next month, 6%, and 1.5% finally in May. To find a standard deviation for a security, find the average historical return, which is 3.6%, and subtract the returns from each month square them, and find the sum. Next, we divide that sum by the number of observations minus 1. In this case, it would be 4, leaving us with the result of 8.675. Taking the square root of that number, we are left with a standard deviation of 2.9. The calculation can be particularly helpful when looking at similar investments in the same asset class. If one investment has a higher standard deviation than the other, that investment is more volatile. Note that past volatility, or lack thereof, doesn't perfectly predict future returns. A stock that has been consistent for months or even years may suddenly experience sharp fluctuations. I could do that with I could do that with Kelly because we've known each other a long time. Okay. Got your number. Yeah, you've got my number. I know. I know. But anyways, it's also a historical measurement. Uh, a standard, uh, a stock, an individual stock that's had low standard deviation for a long time can all of a sudden be crazy volatile in the next period of time. So again, it's less reliable on an individual stock, more reliable on a, uh, a portfolio of stocks. So know your risk measurements. If you know your risk measurements, you will, you will know what to expect and won't be caught off guard when downside volatility occurs. Greater peace of mind comes from knowing your risk and knowing what to expect in down periods. Then we put this in there for you. So now you know the ranges. Dear future me, in any 12-month period, it's highly likely that my portfolio will earn between this and this, or anything in between. So don't be surprised when it does. So, you know, every once in a while you'll get a negative period. I didn't know it could do that. Yes, it can do that. Of course, you can have some pretty good upside too from time to time.